take a, let's take five minutes, okay? Let's let's take a take a cue from our past. Oh, right here, right here, brother, please. Yeah, that way uh, we're not allowed to. Uh, that way he gets Thank you, JT. Spot. Yeah, I move around. I've been practicing on how to stay in one spot uh -oh. uh, per request of the filming team. Oh, you're here to see it, Mallory. <laughs> let's take five minutes, you guys, and uh, let's pray, okay? Just for whatever's in your heart.
Thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, for everything that you're doing in our lives, Father. Thank you, that because we put our, our trust in you, Jesus, the wrath of God abides on us no longer. Thank you that you're restoring our lives. You're restoring children back to their parents. You're re restoring sanity back to, to, to minds and hearts. And you're maturing in people who could not be free of bondage if it were not for your mercy. We thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, um, at, so two weeks ago, um, last time I talked, we went over, um, all that is, you guys, all that was was a technique. It's a technique, everybody, that's, that's just the whole thing of what we do every Saturday morning when I get up here and we, you know, God is, uh, heaven is a gift, can I, right? Yeah. It's not under deserve. Um, it's just a, it's just a technique. And it's it's a script, but it's it's all out of the Bible. It's just a technique to, to to share the gospel, okay? So, but there are some questions that came up afterwards, and 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 it kind of inspired me. Um, the Lord put it on my heart to put together this teaching for tonight, and I hope it will um, answer any questions that came out of that last night or <laughs> two weeks ago. Um, so I want to talk first about. Does God turn his back on us when we sin? I want to talk about when we sin, are we in what is called a state of broken fellowship with God? <clears throat> I believe in the reverence of God. I believe that God is holy. And I believe that when we consider God, we need to consider that from a, a viewpoint of him being holy. And also a viewpoint that, that he has made us holy. So if I ever say anything that seems offhanded, maybe maybe I, uh, um, you know, we can all we sometimes I miscommunicate. But everything that I that I that I teach you up here, I, I'm coming from a point of of reverence for God, because that is how we need to approach Him in in everything. <coughs> So we've all heard that God is so holy that when he was on the cross, that when Jesus was on the cross, that God turns back from him. And there's a scripture that says, right? Okay, so Jesus himself says, L-O-I, L-O-I. The Ma Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So I think... The best human description for what many of us feel what happened on the cross was that because God is so holy that Jesus is recognizing that he has now broken fellowship with God and that God has turned away from him and that Jesus is at this point lost for taking on the sins of humanity. You know, a couple of clues I want to point out and then I'll get to some scriptures here is that Jesus is part of the Trinity, correct? Yes. Can you break apart the Trinity? Can can God be any more holy than Jesus was? No. Because they're all it's all one. They're all one. Right? One. So that's that's your clue. So forsake, to abandon, desert, give up. Let's go to Psalm 22. Or, I didn't put Psalm 22 right there, did I? Okay, so this is a, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is Psalm 22, 1. This is, this, uh, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are the two premier um, texts on the suffering Messiah. And really, this is a prophecy of a man going through extreme trials, extreme suffering, trying to find or maintain faith in God. Remember, Jesus, though he is fully God, he's also fully man at this time. And this is the, right before this incident, Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, if, it, if, it's, if, you, if you will let this cup pass for me, right? But not my will, but your will. You know, and there's these things, and it's part of what a lot of people just say, it's a mystery, and it is a mystery. 
and I, and and it's 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 better looked at with the spirit of God in us, and that's why it's a good thing that we become born again because these things are spiritually discerned. Meaning what that we can't understand them without the spirit of God helping us to understand them, Amen. and it's hard enough for some of these things to understand with the spirit of God in us because some things He just hasn't given us yet to understand. Right? Remember what He tells the disciples about the parables. Uh, I explain things in parables, right? And I tell you the answers. You know, Jesus has a, there's a reason for, for some of these. There's, you know, the Bible has not changed in over 2,000, or not over, but 2,000 years because it was all, it, it was all said. Everything that was written, that needed to be written, was written. And every time you read, uh, so we do our Bible reading every day, every morning, as soon as we get up, and you know, we're right in the Gospels now, and some of the parallel accounts, and we sit there going, did we just go through this? Did we just go through this? No, 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 this is where we're supposed to be, because it's in another Gospel. Well, some of these things need to be uh, redundant, because even though we're reading the same thing over and over again, you, you're, you're all well aware that God reveals different things at different times to you. Right? And it's awesome when, when, when something just... He just points something out to you. So this is obviously not a song. It's a song of David, but it's obviously not anything to do that, that had anything to do with David's life, right? Of course, there wasn't anything in the accounts of David at all that um, that lead us to believe that it was David. However, it's uh, definitely the accounts of what happened to Jesus on the cross. So um, the, the, the school of thought is that what he was doing, what Jesus was doing, was trying to make those in hearing, those witnesses, aware of Psalm 22. He could very well have said something from Psalm or Isaiah 53, but a good Jew would have known, being an oral, it was an oral tradition that when he was re making that reference, that he was pointing them to the prophecy of the Messiah being fulfilled before their very eyes. A lot of them thought he was talking to, uh, they said, oh, he's, he's calling out for Elijah. Well, he was under respiratory distress at this time, hanging on the cross, and his mouth was dry. He even says that in the, in the psalm, that his, that his mouth was dry. And we know his mouth was dry because they gave him a sponge with uh, some, some vinegar wine to wet his lips, right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, for God to have turned his back on... Jesus is really, we really have to look more into that because I don't know how God could turn his back on himself, you know. And there's too many accounts in our lives, our personal testimonies, and there's too many accounts in the Bible where God didn't turn his back on people for sin. He chased after them. So when Adam and Eve sinned, who turned whose back? They did. Who was out hiding and sowing fig leaves together? Yep. And, and hiding from God. Oh, what, what did God do? Wasn't God looking for them? Hey, where are you at? Who told you you were naked? Who told you thou was naked? Did you think about that? Did God say, I rebuked you for your sin? No, He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? <laughs> so they turned their backs as a result of sin. And, 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 and what I want to point out to you tonight, what Scripture points out is that it's the sinner who cannot bear to look upon the holiness of God. Luke 5, 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. You guys remember what happened here, right? He told him, cast your net out on that side of the boat. He said, well, I've been fishing all night, but since you said so, and he pulled up so many fish that it almost sank the boat. Here in the nets, right? So here's one instance of of the sinner not wanting to look upon such righteousness. Um, when Samson's father, uh, when the angel came and talked to Samson's father, told him about you know the stipulations to, that they were supposed to have, that, that Samson was going to be a Nazarite, and that Samson's mom was supposed to observe you know this, these precautions because you know this is what God expected out of him. Uh, when he realized who it was, he said, we are doomed to die. We have seen God. Revelation 1.17, when St. John saw the angel, saw the messenger of God, he fell on his feet as though dead. 
Uh, Isaiah 6, 5, when he, when he saw the, the Holy Presence, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is a recognition from, the, from one in the flesh when they've gazed upon all righteousness and holiness. Daniel 10, 7 through 8, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but there was such holiness in the atmosphere. I, I can only surmise that that's what this is saying. That, uh, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was once, uh, I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Um, pretty good uh, examples here of uh, the sinner turning their back on God, right? The sinner turning their back on holiness. It's the sinner who can't bear to look upon God. And remember in Exodus 20, when the Ten Commandments were, were given to God. Have you read that? Have you, have you read that? Who, who's telling the people about the Ten Commandments? God's telling the people the Ten Commandments. God is speaking to the people, and right after he gives the Ten Commandments, they said, we don't want him to talk to us anymore. They were yeah. terrified. Yeah. Yeah. They said, oh, you talk to us, we'll listen to you. Yeah. Yeah. But they understand. They understood the overwhelming presence of, of holiness and righteousness and, and how sinful they were. Uh, these were some people who, not too long before that, were uh, fashioning a calf. Uh, to worship in the place of God, if you, don't remember, if you remember. So, Genesis chapter 3, he went looking for Adam and Eve. Uh, Luke 15, he leaves the 99 on the hill and went off to looking for the one. He seeks to save the lost, Luke 19, 10. Mark 2, 17, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but righteous, or but the sick. He says, I've not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. <laughs> So he's, 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 all these, all these texts, and he is looking for us, the lost. He's seeking us out, and we are hiding constantly from him. So, God has promised that he will never leave us or forsake us. You hear that a lot, but I don't know, do we really take and take that into our heart and into our thoughts and, and really stand on, on his promise? So, yes, this is Old Testament. So all, all this time, God is saying, I will never leave you or forsake you. All this time, through both covenants. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This is not a one-time deal where he's talking about, in this circumstance, Amen. he's not going to leave you or forsake you. Never. He's saying, I'm not going to leave you or forsake you, ever. Never, as a matter of fact. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot disown Himself. Mm. Remember, we are created in the image of God. Right? Not only are we created in His image, because of the Son of Jesus, or because of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who dwells inside of us, because we have the Spirit of God inside of us, when He looks on us, it's like looking at a reflection of Himself. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, because for He cannot disown Himself. I mean, listen to what this is saying. Mm -hmm. Remember when I started, I said I would never come and present things in an attitude, hopefully in an attitude or a manner or anything, and lead uh, lead anyone to presume that I'm saying anything less than total reverence for God. This doesn't mean that I can go and act like a fool, right? Because God is, he is holy. He, he will not be mocked. He cannot be deceived. We deceive ourselves. We're the sinful, we're, we're, the, we're the ones that are sinful in the flesh. We're the ones who are, who are human, who are, who are impure in the flesh. And, and without God, we are totally lost, without the Son of God. So he cannot disown himself. That, that's pretty heavy. Another, another, uh, Translation says he cannot deny himself. And and look at this right here. So many expositors, for some reason, overlook the 24th verse in the same song that Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Psalm 22, verse 24, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. That's who's that? Who's the afflicted one? Jesus. Jesus. On the cross. He has not hidden his face from him, but, who, but has listened to his cry for help. Hosea and Gomer. You guys, are you not familiar with the story of Hosea? Right? He, God tells this good man to go and marry a prostitute. He knew, and Hosea knew, that Gomer was going to be a faithless woman, mm -hmm. that she was going to leave him, that she was going to make his life miserable, but he did what God told him to do, and she did, and when she did, God said what? Go get her back. Go get her back. Go buy her back. And this is, to, this is, this is an example of the faithlessness of us concerning our relationship to God. God continues to buy us back knowing who we are, knowing we're going to rebel against Him. You know you're going to rebel against God. I know I'm going to rebel against God. But He's never going to leave me or forsake me. And i got to tell you, um, I was in an accountability the other day, and I we do this thing where, you know, you guys come in, and then you you get kicked out so everybody can talk about it and you know see what you know what we're gonna do with you, this kind of thing, right? So um, I remember when um, when Teresa and I first started out, and we I know for years I wouldn't admit any of this stuff, but um, so we we did 30 days on ice and and then the day we got uh, off of ice we got caught fraternizing again. We'll just leave it at that. We got caught again. Just this, the day we got off 30 days of ice. And, and those days, ice, you couldn't leave your room. Either that or you had to go to a certain ice room. You weren't, you weren't getting out and running around like, like going to Al Ricky. Uh -huh. We had an ice room. Um, but then again, we didn't have to wear the vests either. So, no. That was until after. But, um... Yeah, so so we got we got ridden up um, the day we got up thirty days of ice. I knew we was getting gonna get kicked out. I just knew it, right? And so we were. I was making plans with my boss that he was gonna let me live in a tent in his backyard with eight dogs. <laughs> and, uh, I just knew that that's not what God wanted from me. So so by the time it went to. Uh, so we talked to Pastor Carl. Carl says, well, I'll go talk to Pastor Ken. So back in those days, Pastor Ken was, was running the show back there. And uh, Pastor Ken says, okay, okay. And he goes, so okay. So they, they decided to give us grace. And Pastor Ken said, oh, so these are the and just tore them up, right? And so that was a profound experience for me. I was used to serving sentences. I've been incarcerated 35 times. I've only been in prison twice, but I've been in and out of jail almost the entire 90s. Um, I was in and out of jail. I was, I was always getting booked on something. Um, but I was always serving out sentences. So the whole thing of, and when there's a few times where the evidence got lost or the ticket didn't get signed or something, I thought I got away scot free, but that wasn't grace. That was me, you know, sooner or later I knew it was going to pile up and, and, and they'd have me anyways. But this was grace. This was specific grace. Let's give Will and Teresa grace on this one and see where they go from there. And it did more for me than any punishment I've ever served out, any sentence I've ever served out. Amen. Amen. And so when I sin against God, or I rebel against God, and I I, I I turn back to him because my guilt and shame has caused me to turn away from him. And I turn back to him because I remember, I remember that he'll never leave me or forsake me. And I remember that he came, he came looking for me in the first place. When I remember that, his grace causes me to go closer to him where I want to serve him. And I, don't, and I, and I want to continue on in maturity and grow and turn away from the things that I do that, that, that do not bring him pleasure. Right? You guys are... So what does God want from us when we sin? I mean, there's, we, right? We've got to do something, right? 
Amen. Louis? So remember what David, King David said with Bathsheba. For those of you who aren't familiar with the story, it, yeah. it'll be something you all get very familiar with because it's, uh, I mean, it's huge. Like King David was bad. He was wicked, but he was good. He's the guy, he, as a you know, 12-year-old boy, he, he slays a 9-foot or 13-foot giant, whatever it is. We you know, don't really know, but the fact is, is that this shepherd killed a giant in battle that held up the whole army. And so he becomes king and reunites a, a nation under him and under God, and, and, and it's a holy nation. And he turns his back on God, and he gets in the flesh, and, and uh, he, uh, he steps out of line with the, his friend's wife. And not only that, he gets her pregnant to cover it up. What does he do? He has her husband murdered. So, you know, we've got some, some pretty strong issues here with David. Um, and when he, when he finally got to the point where he was able to have that godly sorrow for what he did, and it did take, it did take a, a, the prophet Nathan to remind him that God saw you, kind of a deal, um, then what did he do? He, Psalm 51 is a perfect, it's, I mean, it's great. Uh, for I know my transgression is always before me. He wants acknowledgement of sin. He wants you to acknowledge that you know what you were doing was wrong. David acknowledged that sleeping with Bathsheba, lying to his nation, stepping out on his wife, leaving his men in battle when he should have been out there in battle with them, murdering his best friend to cover up the fact that he got her pregnant. He acknowledged that. When he acknowledged that, verse 4, against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Right? So he wants acknowledgement that what we knew we did was wrong. He wants repentance. So in, in his heart, he's repenting now. And, and, he's, and he wants humility, right? The, a fr the fruit of repentance is humility. So he wants humility. He, he says, I've sinned against you, and whatever you declare is righteous, and, and, and your judgments are, are right. He said, I'm not going to come in and argue and blame it on somebody else. I'm not going to say that she shouldn't have been bathing on the, on the rooftop. I'm not going to say I was really stressed out because you know we were at war. I'm not going to say I sinned against you, God, in this incredible thing that I did. That was this incredibly horrible thing that I did. Verses 16 and 17. He wants this. Look. You do not take, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. He didn't go out there with a bunch of fake I'm sorry's and thank yous. You can say thank you or, or, or uh, forgive me and I'm sorry and I'll never do it again a million times. But unless something is willing, there's, if, if there's got to be a sacrifice there. The sacrifice is repentance. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, what, that's what God wants. A humble and contrite heart. He wants humility. He, he wants us to understand that He is pure and holy, and when we sin, we sin against Him. So repentance... Repentance is beautiful. Repentance is not a work. It is not a work. It is... It is a command, first of all. And it is also a gift. Jesus says, repent and believe. But if he had not said, uh, he said, repent and believe, knowing that, as it said in Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27 here, God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And, and, and look at this. I love this. Move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So he commands repentance, but he also gives us a new heart and the ability to repent. It's a gift. Acts 17.30, in the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Right? God has granted repentance that leads to life. 
talking about the Gentiles here. To them, he's also granted repentance that leads to life. What I'm, what I'm pointing out here is that repentance is a gift, right? It's not a work. Amen. Second Timothy, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And godly sorrow worketh repentance, or bringeth about repentance that leads to salvation. So when we come, when, when, when we become believers, there's no, i got to get saved again because I've been really sinful. It doesn't work that way. You need to humble and a contrite heart. You need to confess that, yes, Lord, what, what, I, what I did was sin against you, and, and come to God in a, with a humble and, and contrite heart. Uh, Romans 2, 4, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. It's very important. It's imperative that 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 you and I take responsibility for what it is that we believe, because it's our own responsibility, right? Our like God is. He sent His Son. God Himself became a man, became flesh, spirit took on flesh, suffering in the most horrible way imaginable. While we were yet sinners and would rebel against him through it all because, because of the flesh, because we're stuck that way. You know, it's important that we have confidence before God. Read the book of Hebrews. Enter boldly. Enter boldly. You know, don't, don't take the, the, the grace of God in vain. Never, never, never. Um, but I'm telling you what, we have to have confidence. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and we do what pleases Him. And what it, it says, what does that, the next scripture say? Anybody know? And this is His command to believe in the one He, in the one he sent. Amen. Thank you. See, it's not a work. It's all these commands. No, it's not, it's not a work. It's a gift. It's a command. It's a gift. It's something that happens when you are born again, and it's something that continually happens throughout our, the rest of our life. So this is this is beautiful. This is your this is your uh, memory verse, right? Can we please all say this together? This is a beautiful scripture. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our unrighteousness. The scripture before that, I should have put it up there, but. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, right, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. There's no way that we can continue to confess every sin that, right? I mean, that that's kind of the whole point here. If we're walking in the light with Jesus, He, he covers us. I don't know anybody who can remember every single sin they've ever committed, and for some of us, um, we would probably have to go live in a monastery for 40 years while we uh, enumerated every single sin to confess. You, you, know, you, you see it now that just, right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't exactly jive. So he wants acknowledgement if we confess our sins. So when, okay, so this word, this term confession means, this is what it means, to say the same thing. So that's exactly what it means. To say the same thing. In this case, we're saying the same thing that God says about sin. If we confess our sins. When we confess, we don't we don't speak what we don't believe, right? Because if we say something, we're committed to what we what we speak, right? When, right? That's why Romans 10, 9, and 10. If we confess in our mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead. Right? For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified. With the mouth, confession is made to salvation. If we so, this is a, our acknowledgement of, of 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 our sin. That you know what God said about what what we did or thought or said was right. And if we acknowledge that, because we have the Son, we have the blood of Jesus covering us. If we acknowledge that God is right, we turn from that. And that's repentance. Repentance is just turning away from anything that doesn't honor God. And there's a lot to it, but God is patient. God is patient. He really is patient. He is full of grace and mercy. 
uh, James 5.16. So we confess so, so we can turn back to God and, and not keep hiding from Him out of guilt. Confess uh, our sins to, so therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Remember that, uh, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us. So we confess our sins to one another. Why? Because if I'm struggling with something and I tell I tell you, then you know I can't I can't harbor this little sin in me anymore. I can't harbor this 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 dirty secret anymore. And now I have an accountability partner, right? Now I I have somebody to help me to maintain accountability, and I get it off of my chest, right? We all know how freeing, how cathartic it is when. We admit to things, and we can we can be free of that bondage. Uh, John twenty and twenty three. I, I like the ESV um, translation on this the best. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. You know, John one twenty nine. Uh, John says, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world." That's 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 the sins that people committed against you. That's the sins that you committed against yourself. That's the sins that you committed against God. If you don't forgive yourself for these sins, if you if you can forgive everybody else in your life, but you can't forgive yourself, you're retaining those sins. Amen. You withhold those sins. So we need confession. We need acknowledgement of our sin. We need repentance. We need to. We need humility. That is it. That is why confession is so important. That is why. Repentance is, is a gift. And that is why humility is a, is a sure sign of repentance. Psalm 66, 18. And I put this in three different... That way there's no confusion. Alright? So, because there is... You know, the... Okay, so uh, your prayers can be hindered, right? If you have a confessed sin. Right? Yep. So, yep. now I want to make a point here. You know, unconfessed sin is only unforgiven sin because you have withheld it, as the previous verse just said. Okay? The NIV says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Cherish is to hold something dear, to hold something tied to your heart. Right? If I cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. The NLT, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So to me, that's saying exactly the same because confession means to acknowledge that I sinned against God in this. The Amplify, I think, really sums it up. If I regard sin and baseness in my heart, that is, if I know it is there and do nothing about it, the Lord will not hear me. You know why? Because, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him whatever we ask because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. When we are turned away and hiding from God, we cannot receive His gifts because we are we we have deemed ourselves unworthy, or we just keep we continue to turn away from them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Amen. It's not God. It's not God withholding. God gave it all up two thousand years ago. He, he, Jesus took care of that. God's not mad at you. Look, Pastor Tim. God is not mad at me. Jesus took care of that. He loves me. He loves you. But God is not mocked. So, you know, so why doesn't God answer our prayers otherwise? If this, if God, I've been praying on this thing for, for years and God didn't answer my prayers. Have you heard Paul storm the flesh? Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. And he finally said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. Okay? So, you know, sometimes we're asking sincerely, and we're, Paul, at this point, Paul was, 
a stalwart man of God. He was he was a, a man of God's man of God. He was a very very humble, very pure individual as far as people can go. He was confident before God. He was cleaned up before God because he let God clean him up through, through the blood of Jesus, right? So sometimes it's just not God's will. You've heard it said before, no, no is an answer. But sometimes it's just not in God's will for whatever reason. <laughs> you know, um, so there's many reasons. You know, it, you know, there's there is a willful disobedience and persistent sin, right? That we just covered right over here. Cherished sin, unconfessed sin, regarded sin that I did nothing about. Uh, maybe thinking that God was as cool about it as I was. God's the cool dad, you know. Uh, <laughs> It's, and, and and a lot of times you guys we we just we all we all have to grow up all of us we all grow, we all have to we all you know babies and um and then sometimes we just ask with the wrong motives right uh, James four three it says you you ask not or you have not because you ask not sometimes I'm gonna give it to you because I know you're gonna spend it on your lust. Right? They ask for the wrong thing and for the wrong motive. So, um, yes, confess your sins to God. Yes, be bold enough and confident enough to take it to God and be be intentional, detailed. Don't be like, "Well, God, I, you know, I was I was pretty sinful today." Amen. No. You need to you need to make yourself aware, like. It's a, it's a, you know, like if, okay, so if I am apologizing to my wife, which happens often, so, and, and I, and I just say, sorry, right, so I, I know I need to acknowledge, I need to verbally acknowledge, she needs to know that I know what it was that I'm sorry for, right? Right. Um, so, you know, we have these sins, you guys, we live, we, we live in the flesh. Paul calls us saints, right? Paul never called Paul. Paul has never called you from from beyond the within the Bible. He's never called you a sinner. He called you a saint. Yes, we're we're sinners in the flesh, absolutely, right? And then that's just all. That's just how it's going to be. We learn and we grow and we mature. And and because of the the God granted repentance and His grace and mercy and His love and His patience with us, we 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 do grow. We get better. We certainly get better. Um, but there's the difference here is between a say a sheep. So maybe that night that sheep that, that one that got away, right? He, he left the 99 there because he had a sheep that got away. I imagine the sheep fell in a ditch somewhere, right? Sheep don't play in the mud. The sheep, you know, I oh. fall in the mud and then he, he uh. wants to get cleaned up. <laughs> so so we're sheep, you guys. That's the difference. If, if you're a sheep. Right, your shepherd's going to come along and pick you up because you have fellowship with him and his blood purifies you from all unrighteousness. He washes you off. He cleans you off. Right? But the, the flip side of that are pigs. Pigs will waller in the mud. They, they look for muddy spots. If you ever had a pig or a pig farm, you know you have to have a waller for the pig. So we're sheep. It, and it, if you're behaving like sheep, if you're behaving like sheep, you know who God is, and you're protected, and you're loved. But if you're a pig, the hand of God is not on you. If you're a pig, you're not repentant. You're dirty. You're still dirty, right? John chapter 13. Um, so I want to wrap this up. You are children of God. right? I'm a child of God. We have to have confidence before God. Go boldly, right? We enter the most holy of holies. No more of that. We, we don't come in here with a rope tied around our, our, our ankle and, and a team out there ready to pull our dead bodies out because we offended God. God sees His Son in us. He sees righteousness because the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has imparted that to us. I want to open up your Bibles. I didn't put this down here, but open up your Bibles to Luke 18. There's another difference between, say, sheep and pigs. <laughs> Chapter 18, starting at verse 9. 
It's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Yep. <laughs> to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, boy, that says a lot, doesn't it? Come on. Jesus told this parable. To the pigs, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this guy, this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. <laughs> but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt himself will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Amen. Amen. I don't know that anything else uh, needs to be said. God gives the increase. So if there's any, if you guys have any questions, just hold back and we can we can talk afterwards and I'll dismiss everybody. Um, I appreciate everybody for being attentive and uh, uh, I love you guys. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this time. I, I thank you for um, your Holy Spirit living and breathing inside of us. And uh, I, I thank you so much for everything that, that you're, you're doing in, in all of our lives. And, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.